Hello students, this is Dr. Souchard with a clinical biochemistry presentation about toxicologic causes of metabolic acidosis. The chemicals we're going to be focusing on, pictured at the top of the slide, are CO, carbon monoxide, CN, cyanide, and methanol, MEOH. The objectives are that after watching this presentation and studying the related materials, you should be able to identify at least three toxicologic causes of metabolic acidosis, and I just named three of them, so that shouldn't be difficult, to describe how CO, CN, and MEOH interfere with normal oxygen use, explain why pulse oximetry readings are unreliable with carbon monoxide poisoning, and we've got a second slide of objectives asking you to be able to distinguish uncouplers of oxidative phosphorylation from inhibitors of oxidative phosphorylation, naming at least one example of each, and be able to draw the metabolic pathway leading to elevated serum lactate levels that occurs during anaerobic metabolism. While the previous slides provided your measurable, and therefore testable, objectives, here I'm giving an outline of the structure of this presentation. First, we're going to consider what's the deal with oxygen, why do we need it, and how do we measure oxygenation clinically. Then we'll look at ways oxygen absorption, delivery, and utilization are affected by various disease states, comparing non-toxicologic versus toxicologic etiologies, and how these lead to anaerobic metabolism, which results in a metabolic acidosis with an increased serum lactate. Then we'll look specifically at some toxicologic causes of metabolic acidosis in more detail, considering how it is that they alter oxygen usage determining at which organ, organelle, or molecular site where they cause this interference. And as already stated, the poisons we're going to focus on most are carbon monoxide, cyanide, and methanol. But near the end, we'll also cover some uncouplers of oxidative phosphorylation, which is a distinctly different mechanism than inhibition of oxidative phosphorylation. Lastly, we'll be reviewing the relevant material from first aid on these topics. I'll be using the 2019 edition here, so the page numbers may be different in the version you have. With this review, I'm hoping to save you some time preparing for USMLE Step 1, since you'll already have learned these topics as well as you'll need to. Let's get to it then. Oxygen. Why do we need it? What good is it anyway? If we look at how many molecules of ATP are generated per molecule of glucose consumed, there's a huge difference between aerobic and anaerobic metabolism. The theoretical maximum is either 36 or 38 ATP per glucose, depending on whether it's a eukaryotic or prokaryotic organism. But either way, that's many times more ATP than you get from anaerobic metabolism. The ATP-efficient aerobic option in eukaryotes, such as humans, requires the use of mitochondria. And mitochondria require oxygen as the final electron acceptor in the electron transport chain. Here's a depiction of oxidative phosphorylation in a mitochondrion. Here's the electron transport chain in the mitochondrial inner membrane. The light blue arrows show the movement of electrons down the electron transport chain, starting at either complex 1 or complex 2, transferring the electrons to ubiquinone, which is labeled with the capital letter Q, that transfers the electrons to complex 3, then to cytochrome C, and then to complex 4 which, since it oxidizes cytochrome C, is also called cytochrome C oxidase. And we also see with the pink arrows that complexes 1, 3, and 4 use the energy from the electron transport to pump hydrogen ions from the matrix into the intermembrane space, setting up an electrochemical gradient across the intermitochondrial membrane. At the end of the electron transport chain, we see oxygen acting as the final electron acceptor, where it is reduced into water. This step is virtually the entire reason we need oxygen. And then we use the electrochemical gradient previously established as hydrogen ions flow back into the matrix through ATP synthase, which synthesizes ATP from ADP and inorganic phosphate. Thus, the entire body can be considered a mitochondrial support system. The heart pumps the blood, the oxygen transport mechanism, and the lungs provide the interface for oxygen to get into the blood, the GI system provides the glucose to burn, also that our mitochondria can efficiently make enough ATP to support our survival and to allow the higher mental functions that characterize us as humans. How relatively important is oxygen as a basic need? Well, in the wilderness survival literature, they have a rule of threes. To a first approximation, a human can survive three minutes without air, three days without water, and three weeks without food. 
On a minute-to-minute or second-to-second basis, therefore, maintaining oxygenation is the most important thing our bodies do. We need to maintain oxygen delivery to survive. And I'm going to first give some examples of non-toxic logic ways that this could be impaired. For instance, if the heart is not pumping enough blood, we go into cardiogenic shock, which might be from a cardiac arrhythmia or a decrease in inotropy causing heart failure. Even if the blood is being pumped well, there is still the downstream plumbing to consider. If you have peripheral vascular disease, say a narrowing from cholesterol deposits, that will impair downstream perfusion and lead to tissue ischemia. Impaired gas exchange might occur from nearly any kind of pulmonary disease or infection. The figure here on the right shows pneumonia, where the alveoli get filled with fluid, making it much harder for the oxygen to diffuse into the blood. And if the hemoglobin levels are low with anemia, that will reduce the amount of oxygen that can be carried to the tissues. It's relatively rare, however, that anemia is the sole reason for tissue ischemia, unless it is very severe or very acute, since there are compensatory mechanisms such as tachycardia to reflexively increase oxygen delivery. When a patient has decreased oxygen delivery, there are some signs and symptoms that develop. Patients become tachycardic. This compensates for the reduced oxygen delivery by increasing cardiac output. The tachycardia is mediated by beta-1 adrenergic tone on the heart since the adrenals pump out more catecholamines, epinephrine and norepinephrine, to increase sympathetic tone. The increased catecholamines stimulate other organs, including the sweat glands. So you may also see diaphoresis, or sweating, as in the photo here a patient allowed me to take showing beads of sweat on her forehead. Sweating is an objective physical sign that can't really be faked. So when you see it, you need to consider that the patient could have something very seriously wrong that needs to be addressed. Patients can also feel shortness of breath, and they can also appear anxious or even complain of a sense of impending doom, like they're going to die. Patients with panic attacks might have a similar complaint, but they're probably not going to be tachycardic and sweaty. Laboratory evaluation of a patient with impaired oxygen delivery can show evidence of a shift toward anaerobic metabolism, as pictured in the figure on the top right. A basic metabolic panel will show a metabolic acidosis with a low serum bicarbonate and the serum lactate levels start to elevate. With very severe impairment of oxygen delivery, the patient can't make enough ATP to support neurologic functions, and that's when they lose consciousness, have seizures, or die. In fact, seizure coma death is a pretty frequent final common pathway for many diseases. We've been talking about elevated lactate levels a few times already, but where does the lactate come from anyway? This is a single-figure summary of high-yield carbohydrate metabolism. Starting in the upper left with glucose, we go through glycolysis to form two molecules of pyruvate, making a little bit of ATP and reducing NAD plus to NADH. Pyruvate then enters the mitochondria, gets decarboxylated forming acetyl-CoA, which combines with oxaloacetate and enters the TCA cycle, producing the NADH and FADH2, which power the electron transport chain, where we use up oxygen and produce lots of ATP. But when oxygen isn't available, the electron transport chain shuts down and we stop making ATP efficiently. But we still need to make some ATP from glycolysis, even if it's inefficient. And we're accumulating NADH all this time, meaning that we're also running out of NAD+. In order to allow glycolysis to continue, we need to convert the NADH back into NAD+, so the NADH produced in glycolysis reduces pyruvate into lactate. Note, though, that the reduction of pyruvate into lactate consumes H plus ions, and therefore, if anything, reduces the amount of acid. What is typically taught is that the production of lactic acid causes the acidosis and lowers the pH, but the chemical equation here shows that to not be true. The production of lactic acid does not cause the acidosis. But it is certainly true that anaerobic metabolism is associated with an elevated lactate and with a metabolic acidosis. So where does the acidosis come from then? Contrary to what you've been told, that serum bicarbonate is our primary pH buffering system, our primary buffer for acid for H plus ions is the continuing production of ATP. Look at this equation. ADP has a negative 3 charge, inorganic phosphate a negative 2 charge, and ATP is negative 4. To balance the equation, we see that in ATP synthesis, one H plus ion is consumed and a molecule of water is spit out. This is where acidosis is first buffered. Conversely, every time ATP is hydrolyzed, it produces an H plus ion. 
So it is continuing ATP hydrolysis outstripping ATP production that produces the metabolic acidosis. It would be most correct to say that anaerobic metabolism leads to a lactate-associated acidosis than that lactate causes the acidosis. They're both markers of anaerobic metabolism, but one does not cause the other. Here's a quick review of acid-base physiology. A metabolic acid-base disorder is characterized by changes in the serum bicarbonate level, and in a metabolic acidosis, the bicarbonate level is low. This typically occurs because there is accumulation of other organic acids that titrate or consume the bicarbonate. In a lactate-associated metabolic acidosis, it's as if the lactate is taking the place of the bicarbonate, so the bicarb level is low. Virtually all non-toxicologic causes of metabolic acidosis with an elevated serum lactate occur from decreased oxygen delivery to the tissues, and we call this condition shock. Shock can be defined as inadequate organ perfusion to meet the tissue's oxygen demand. Toxicologic causes of metabolic acidosis with elevated lactate can be from impaired oxygen delivery, but they can also be from impaired oxygen utilization, despite adequate delivery, or impaired mitochondrial efficiency, despite adequate oxygen delivery and utilization. Now we're going to take a closer look at carbon monoxide, cyanide, and methanol. Carbon monoxide is a product of incomplete combustion. Usually when carbonaceous fuels are burned, we get CO2, but some amount will only be oxidized to CO. Carbon monoxide poisoning can occur from faulty heating equipment, any kind of fire, and car exhaust, although this is less common now that nearly all cars use catalytic converters in their exhaust systems. In addition, there are endogenous sources of carbon monoxide, such that we normally have carboxyhemoglobin levels around 1%. That's to say, about 1% of your hemoglobin is normally bound to CO, but it's such a small amount that it doesn't cause any problems. The source of endogenous carbon monoxide is heme metabolism, as old red blood cells are broken down and we recover the iron to make new ones. Heme is oxidized by heme oxygenase, splitting heme's porphyrin ring open to produce biliveridin, releasing iron and producing one molecule of carbon monoxide. Biliveridin accumulates in the bile, and is what makes the bile green, bili for bile and verd for green, using the same Latin root as in verdant, or in Vermont, the green mountain state. So far, we've had heme, a red pigment, turn into a green pigment, but the color changes keep happening. Biliverdin is reduced to bilirubin, which is what makes people yellow or jaundiced with several liver diseases. The rubin part of bilirubin literally means red, like a ruby, but is actually more of a yellow-orange color. Then, the bilirubin is converted to urobilinogen, which is uncolored, but is metabolized further into urobilin, making urine yellow. And in the GI tract, urobilinogen is converted to stercobilin, which makes poop brown. So the colors for all these substances, blood, bile, jaundice with liver disease, urine, and stool, ultimately derive from heme. Here's a figure from compoundchem.com on the chemistry of body fluid colors that you can look over more closely on your own if you're interested. Carbon monoxide is among many small simple gases found in trace amounts in our body that are used as chemical transmitters. On the lower left here, we see heme metabolism releasing CO, and it has some downstream effects that we're not going to bother with now. We also see hydrogen gas and hydrogen sulfide gas, and also nitric oxide gas. Clinically and pharmacologically, nitric oxide is by far the most important of these gases. It helps regulate smooth muscle tone in the vasculature, and you're going to hear a lot more about this in the pharmacology course. Carbon monoxide binds very avidly to the heme and hemoglobin, much more avidly than oxygen, so it doesn't take very high levels of CO exposure for it to interfere with the ability to transport oxygen. Carbon monoxide causes a functional anemia. By limiting the amount of oxygen carried by the blood, it lowers oxygen delivery. In the graph on the right, we see the oxygen-hemoglobin dissociation curve. When there's no carbon monoxide around, there's a sigmoidal S-shape to it, showing the cooperativity between hemoglobin subunits. But if there was, say, 50% carboxyhemoglobin, that limits the oxygen content of the blood and also reduces the cooperativity, creating a hyperbolic shape to the curve, making it harder to release the oxygen that the blood is still carrying to the tissues. Most people remember that CO competes with oxygen binding to hemoglobin, but it binds to other heme moieties too, in other enzymes and proteins such as in myoglobin. So there's more to CO poisoning than just the functional anemia, although it's a reasonable first approximation of what's going on.
This now leads to a discussion of how we measure oxygen and blood. The most common way to do this is through pulse oximetry, which is basically a portable spectrophotometer. Pulse oximetry is cheap, easy, and non-invasive. The pulse oximeter probe is typically placed on a fingertip with a light source emitting two wavelengths on one side, which shine through the tissue, and a light detector on the other side. A pulse oximeter works because there are differences in light absorption between oxyhemoglobin and deoxyhemoglobin, as we know from the color differences between arterial, bright red, and venous, dark red, blood. In this figure, we see the absorbent spectra of oxyhemoglobin in red, deoxyhemoglobin in blue, and also carboxyhemoglobin in black. There are clearly differences in the red and blue lines, and the pulse oximeter measures the light absorbance at two different wavelengths, allowing it to differentiate between the relative amount of oxyhemoglobin and deoxyhemoglobin. There's just a little bit of math. It's second year algebra to solve two simultaneous equations. And then the pulse oximeter readout reports the percent of the total hemoglobin that is oxyhemoglobin. But you should also notice that the absorption spectrum of carboxyhemoglobin is quite similar to that of oxyhemoglobin, and we're going to get back to that shortly. Here is a pretty typical monitor screen from a patient admitted to a monitored unit in the hospital. And you should consider stopping the video here briefly and name what the green, aqua, and blue tracings are supposed to represent. I'll give you a few seconds for that. So the green is the patient's electrocardiographic tracing, which we see here is going at 74 per minute. The aqua is the pulse oximetry tracing. We see that it's a little offset from the ECG tracing because it takes a little time from ventricular depolarization until the pulse wave of systole reaches the distal extremities. And when it does, the amount of blood in the fingertip goes up a little bit, and the light absorbance also goes up. So the pulse oximeter simultaneously is measuring the actual pulsing of blood as well as the percent oxygen saturation, here at 100%, hence it's a pulse oximeter. The blue line is the patient's respirations as measured from greater than one leads placed on the chest. As the patient inspires and expires, these move slightly away and then slightly closer to one another. If the patient is resting quietly, you get a much cleaner, regular waveform, whereas here it looks like the patient is moving and or talking, so we see a very irregular waveform that the computer is calculating at 10 respirations per minute. The following 11 second video demonstrates a pulse oximeter in action. In fact, even though the pulse ox is not an ECG tracing, we can still guess the patient's cardiac rhythm. See if you can diagnose this patient's arrhythmia. The pulse ox tracing showed an irregular rhythm, and it was irregularly irregular. Therefore, this patient has atrial fibrillation. I mentioned earlier that carboxyhemoglobin had a similar light absorbance spectrum to oxyhemoglobin. It's red. In fact, it's very bright red. If you were a butcher slicing up a cow and trying to sell the steaks, the flesh would look dark and slightly purplish. Maybe you could sell a lot more steak if you exposed it to carbon monoxide because carboxyhemoglobin and carboxymyoglobin are very bright red, making the meat look fresher. In fact, this is commonly done, but the amount of CO it takes is nowhere near enough to be harmful. Here, however, is someone who was harmed, indeed killed by carbon monoxide. You may read in various sources that CO poisoning causes cherry red discoloration, which can occur, but it's virtually only seen in fatal cases where you will find cherry red lividity. Lividity means that after death, the blood is settled by gravity into the most dependent portions of the body, and there's no more vascular tone, so the tiny vessels and capillaries in these areas are engorged with the carboxyhemoglobin-containing blood, and we'll see this kind of neon pink color that I think is a better description than cherry red. So we've explained the neon pink areas due to the lividity, but what caused the pale areas also on the back and buttocks? This patient died in a supine position, facing upward, so all the blood settled towards the back. But in the areas actually in contact with the floor, the weight of the body occluded the microvasculature, squeezing out all of the blood and resulting in areas of pallor. There's a range of signs and symptoms you can get from carbon monoxide poisoning depending upon how much you've been exposed to. At lower levels, you can get headache, malaise, nausea, and vomiting, which are pretty nonspecific. If three people from the same household presented with those symptoms at the same time, 
It would be very easy to mistake those symptoms as coming from, say, the flu or an otherwise benign GI virus. And if it was just one person with those symptoms, you wouldn't even have a clue suggesting that there might have been an environmental exposure going on. And we also see here that it takes some fairly high CO levels to cause hypoxic signs and symptoms with neurologic or cardiac dysfunction. As I've alluded to before, carbon monoxide confuses standard pulse oximeters, which are designed to differentiate deoxyhemoglobin from oxyhemoglobin based upon measuring absorbance of two light wavelengths. I've also shown you that carboxyhemoglobin absorbs light very similarly to oxyhemoglobin. In fact, it's even redder than oxyhemoglobin. So a pulse oximeter will get confused and interpret carboxyhemoglobin as oxyhemoglobin, reporting a falsely elevated and therefore falsely reassuring oxygen saturation in the presence of carbon monoxide poisoning. This has been reported in the medical literature as a pulse oximetry gap, in that there's a gap between the true oxygen saturation and the oxygen saturation reported through pulse oximetry. But this is not because the pulse oximeter is working incorrectly, it's just reporting things as well as it can based upon how it was programmed. That program only considers oxyhemoglobin and deoxyhemoglobin, so it can't possibly detect anything else, and it does its best. If you want to differentiate more than two kinds of hemoglobin, you have to use additional light wavelengths. Again, if you remember second year algebra, to solve for x number of variables, you need x number of simultaneous equations. A standard pulse oximeter uses two wavelengths of light, so it can only differentiate two kinds of hemoglobin. A more accurate measurement can be made with a co-oximeter, which uses four light wavelengths to determine oxyhemoglobin, deoxyhemoglobin, carboxyhemoglobin, and methemoglobin, which I haven't mentioned yet. With methemoglobin, the iron in the heme group is in the plus three state, a ferric ion, instead of the plus two state, a ferrous ion. Methemoglobin has a different color, more brownish, and similar to carboxyhemoglobin, it doesn't carry and transport oxygen. We normally have a methemoglobin level of around 1%, which again is similar to carboxyhemoglobin, and this is low enough to cause no problems. Cooximetry is typically ordered in a blood sample sent to the lab, but there are also portable cooximeters available, as shown here, made by the Massimo Company, which is located in the UC Irvine Research Park. How do we treat patients with carbon monoxide poisoning? Oxygen competes with and displaces CO. Sure, carbon monoxide binds more avidly to heme, but we can overwhelm that if we provide lots of oxygen. The half-life of carboxyhemoglobin, breathing room air, 21% oxygen, is between 5 to 6 hours. If you increase the partial pressure of oxygen five-fold by administering 100% oxygen, that reduces the half-life by a factor of 5, down to about an hour. And if you put the patient in a hyperbaric chamber with 100% oxygen at 2.8 to 3 atmospheres of pressure, that reduces carboxyhemoglobin half-life to about 20 minutes. The potential benefits of hyperbaric oxygen versus normobaric oxygen for CO poisoning are controversial. At UCI Medical Center, we do not have hyperbaric oxygen therapy, so we'd have to consider whether the patient is stable enough to be transferred if we had a patient with significant carbon monoxide exposure. And since the benefits are controversial, this can be difficult. At places where hyperbaric oxygen therapy is available, it is used most commonly to treat poorly healing wounds. The photo in the lower right shows a patient getting hyperbaric oxygen in a monoplace chamber, most likely for a wound-related indication. This kind of setup assumes that the patient is stable and won't need any other acute intervention. Larger, multi-place chambers that allow room for monitoring equipment and healthcare providers would be needed if the patient was unstable, as most CO poison patients needing hyperbaric oxygen would be. And with that, we're done discussing carbon monoxide. We are now moving on to cyanide, which comes from the Greek kyanos, meaning dark blue. There is a vivid dark blue pigment called Prussian blue, each molecule of which contains 18 cyanide ions, which is a prominent pigment used in one of my favorite works of art, The Great Wave off Kanagawa. So then, cyan is blue. It's the same root word as in cyanosis. If someone looks blue, we say that they're cyanotic. The photo here is of a 24-year-old woman with Tetralogy of Fallot, a congenital cyanotic heart disease where deoxygenated blood from the right side of the heart gets shunted over to the left, bypassing the lungs and lowering the oxygen saturation of arterial blood. This patient is not wearing purple lipstick, that's her actual color. This points out that there's a lot of Greek and Latin terms that we still use in medicine, and recognizing these can make your life a little easier. 
With regard to medical terms for color, arith means red, as in erythrocytes, red blood cells. Xanth means yellow, as in xanthoma or xanthelasma, which are yellow fatty deposits. Porphyr means purple, as in porphyria, a disease of heme synthesis where the urine can turn purple. Melan means black, as in melanoma, a tumor of the skin pigment cells that is often black. And I'd never really considered that polio was a color-related term, but it means gray. Poliomyelitis is an inflammation of the gray matter of the spinal cord, just like the word says. And you already know about leuk, meaning white, as with leukocytes, white blood cells. Cyanide is a mitochondrial poison. It inhibits cytochrome C oxidase, part of complex 4 in the electron transport chain. In the figure here, we see cytochrome C dropping off a pair of electrons onto cytochrome C oxidase. They flow through the enzyme, landing first on one copper atom, then to cytochrome A, a cofactor containing a heme group, then cytochrome A3, which also contains heme, then to a second copper atom, and finally combining with molecular oxygen and some hydrogen ions to form water. When cyanide inhibits mitochondria, it does so by binding to ferric iron, Fe plus 3, in the heme moieties of cytochrome C oxidase. That shuts down electron transport. The whole electron transport chain stops, hydrogen ion pumping stops, and the hydrogen ion electrochemical gradient rapidly disperses as the mitochondrion makes its last few ATP molecules. Oxygen consumption stops, and you can try giving all the oxygen you want, but it just can't be utilized. We end up with a type of asphyxia, another Greek word for without a pulse. Sphuxis is the same root word as seen in sphygmomanometer, literally meaning a pulse measurer, even though we kind of use it to measure the blood pressure. However, in English, the word asphyxia refers to a condition of oxygen deprivation, typically from apnea, a lack of breathing. Asphyxia can occur from different causes. Central asphyxia could occur from severe brainstem injury, where the respiratory center is damaged. Mechanical asphyxia could occur in any situation where the chest wall can't move, such as by being buried under debris. Or there can be chemical asphyxia, which is what occurs with cyanide poisoning. With chemical asphyxiation, the lungs can work for gas exchange and the blood can carry oxygen and deliver it to the cells, but the cells just can't use it. The cells are starved for what oxygen usually does, even though oxygen may be provided in abundance. Since oxygen isn't being used, the venous blood has higher oxygen tension than typical and can become arterialized. I bring this up because it's easy to make the mistake of thinking a cyanide poison patient might be cyanotic, but they shouldn't be. If anything, a cyanide patient's blood should be redder than expected since the oxygen is not being used. When cyanide turns off electron transport, the efficient ATP production in the mitochondria ceases. Anaerobic ATP production continues, but it can't provide enough ATP to maintain high-level cognitive functions, causing the victim to collapse and pass out. Cyanide is among a small group of poisons considered human knockdown agents, because a sufficient dose results in rapid collapse, apnea, and death. And the photo here shows one such use of cyanide. This is a canister of Zyklon B, used for human extermination in the Nazi death camps of World War II. Well, how do we treat cyanide poisoning that has not yet become lethal? That would be good to know. Remember that the cyanide ion binds to ferric Fe plus 3 ions, which is why it inhibits cytochrome C oxidase by binding to the heme moieties in cytochrome A and A3. Blood has much more ferrous Fe plus 2 ions than we need to transport oxygen, so we can oxidize a small portion of it to the ferric Fe plus 3 state forming a small percentage of methemoglobin, not enough to impair oxygen delivery, which acts as an alternate cyanide sink. And we can do this pharmacologically by administering nitrites. An alternative to nitrite therapy uses cobalamin, as found in vitamin B12, cyanocobalamin. Vitamin B12 is a large molecule where a cobalt atom is complex to cyanide. But there's a closely related drug called hydroxocobalamin, where the cobalt is complexed instead to a hydroxyl group, but it would prefer to bind instead to cyanide, becoming cyanocobalamin, which compared to cyanide is virtually non-toxic. The dose of hydroxocobalamin needed is very large, with an initial dose being 5 grams, because each molecule is big and only binds to one cyanide ion each. You have to give a lot, and this drug is bright red, making the patients and their urine and other body fluids red too.
So we're finishing up cyanide. I'm gonna take a little break now and show you a few cyanide related videos I found that I think are great illustrations. At the heart of this system are four protein complexes, numbered one through four. Complexes one, three, and four directly pump protons from the matrix into the intermembrane space. Proton pumping requires energy, and the four protein complexes get this energy by transferring electrons through a series of coupled reactions. This linked process of electron transport is why the four complexes are collectively referred to as the electron transport chain. Cytochrome C carries the electron to complex four. The electron transport chain ends in complex four, where a series of reactions involving four electrons converts a molecule of oxygen to two molecules of water. The proton gradient is strengthened because four protons from the matrix are incorporated into water molecules and another four are pumped into the intermembrane space. In the absence of oxygen, the electron transfer comes to a halt, meaning that ATP synthesis also stops. Indeed, the reason we breathe oxygen is so that it can serve as the final electron acceptor at the end of the electron transport chain. A group of proteins on the mitochondrion's membrane form the electron transport chain. Carrier molecules donate electrons from food to the chain. As the electrons flow, the chain pumps protons out of the membrane. These protons move back across the membrane through the protein ATP synthase, causing it to spin and make the cell's energy source, ATP. When cyanide is ingested or inhaled, it inhibits the protein cytochrome C oxidase. This backs up the whole chain, and ATP production stops. Within minutes, cell death can occur. A dramatic end to the life of a convicted war criminal. Just seconds after the United Nations court upheld his 20-year sentence for war crimes, Slobodan Praliak refused to sit, instead proclaiming his innocence. Slobodan Praliak is not a war criminal. And then the retired Croatian army general pulled a small vial from his jacket, tipped his head back and drank the liquid, telling the court it was poison. Stop, please. Uh, please sit down. A short time later, an ambulance arrived, taking Praliak to a Dutch hospital where he died. The courtroom is now a crime scene. And the big question is, how did the convicted criminal manage to get that vial of poison into The Hague, where security is tight? Metal detectors are used and electronic equipment, including cell phones, as well as food and drinks, are prohibited. The Dutch police are now investigating. Linda Kincaid, CNN. Next, we're going to discuss methanol. Methanol and ethylene glycol together are known as the toxic alcohols, which are relatively low molecular weight, non-ethanol alcohols that share some common characteristics. They induce an ethanol-like inebriation, and they can also cause severe metabolic acidosis. Methanol is found in a few products, including windshield wiper fluid antifreeze, not the radiator antifreeze, which contains ethylene glycol, the other toxic alcohol. Methanol is also what burns in cans of Sterno, which are used to keep food and chafing dishes warm at buffets. And every couple of years, there are large outbreaks of methanol poisoning related to consumption of improperly produced moonshine liquor. The photo here shows a hospital ward in India a few years ago during one of these outbreaks when they ran out of beds and the patients were lined up sitting in a hallway to receive treatment. Methanol is also known for causing retinal toxicity, 
which can manifest with visual complaints such as blurred vision, blindness, or a complaint of seeing drifting spots that appear like falling snow. Here is a fundoscopic view of the retina of a 30-year-old man who drank methanol from a Korean case report. Now I know that this photo by itself is not very helpful without a normal view to compare it with. So here we have that patient's fundoscopic view on the left compared with a normal eye on the right. And here you can appreciate that the optic disc is quite blurred in the affected eye. You really have to look in a lot of people's eyes to get good at it and to be able to recognize abnormalities easily. And it's unfortunate that few doctors outside of ophthalmology routinely do this because it's a nearly direct view into the nervous system. Another neurologic injury that can occur in the most severe cases of methanol poisoning, and it would have to be fatal to see a dissected brain as shown here, is hemorrhage into the putamen, the most lateral part of the basal ganglia. On this slide, we also see putaminal injury on a brain MRI of a live patient with severe methanol poisoning. With the toxic alcohols, the parent compound is not particularly nasty. It has to be metabolized to cause metabolic acidosis and other toxic effects. Methanol is metabolized similarly to ethanol and using the same enzymes, first being oxidized by alcohol dehydrogenase into formaldehyde, and then oxidized again by aldehyde dehydrogenase into formic acid, which is the smallest possible organic acid and can dissociate into H and a formate ion. Accumulation of formate itself causes a metabolic acidosis, but in addition, formate has a cyanide-like effect on cytochrome C oxidase, so the patient can also accumulate lactic acid as well through the mechanisms we've already discussed. Methanol poisoning is treated by preventing the formation of toxic metabolites by blocking alcohol dehydrogenase. This can be done with a drug called fomepazole or even by giving the patient ethanol to compete for the same active site of ADH. Since methanol, formaldehyde, formic acid, and lactic acid are all small water-soluble molecules, hemodialysis can also be used to treat methanol poisoning. And hemodialysis can also correct concurrent pH and electrolyte abnormalities at the same time. Now we're going to take a very brief side trip with the nutritional correlate related to methanol. You may have heard something negative about aspartame, the artificial sweetener, and this is based on the fact that aspartame is metabolized into the amino acids aspartate, phenylalanine, and a molecule of methanol, which is absolutely true. The opponents of aspartame claim that despite its actual very good safety profile, the metabolic byproducts of aspartame metabolism cause neurotoxicity, since aspartic acid is neuroexcitatory, which is technically true, and methanol is a neurotoxin, which is also technically true. But don't you believe this for a minute. The truth is that aspartame is quite safe. While it is broken down, releasing aspartic acid, we also find aspartic acid, which is just another amino acid, in every food we eat containing protein and it causes no problem. If you bathed a neuron with aspartic acid, that would be a problem, but that doesn't happen when you ingest it. Also, the amount of methanol released from aspartame is inconsequential, and we find trace amounts of methanol in many other foods that are safe. For instance, a glass of tomato juice has six times as much methanol as a 12-ounce can of diet soda. And you'd have to ingest 40 times the amount of diet soda typically consumed just to get a serum methanol level 1% of that needed to cause toxic effects. However, the truth is also that aspartame can be unsafe, but only for people with phenylketonuria. PKU is an autosomal recessive inborn error of phenylalanine metabolism. And it's the phenylalanine part of aspartame that's the problem here. So packets of aspartame-containing sweeteners have a warning label on them. Lastly, we're going to discuss uncouplers of oxidative phosphorylation. Up until now, we've covered inhibitors of oxidative phosphorylation, but uncoupling is a different mechanism. The term coupling refers to the linkage between the electron transport chain working to create a hydrogen ion gradient and the subsequent use of this gradient to create ATP. There are two processes coupled together normally, but they may become uncoupled if something other than proton flow through ATP synthase allows the hydrogen ion gradient to be dissipated. What uncouplers do is to increase the permeability of the inner mitochondrial membrane to H plus ions, and the energy represented by the H plus ion gradient is dissipated as heat instead of being used to create ATP. We have endogenous methods for creating such uncoupling when we need to generate body heat. There's a protein called UCP1, 
uncoupling protein 1, or thermogenin, that forms pores in the inner mitochondrial membrane to generate heat in a controlled manner. There are also some drugs, or poisons, that are exogenous uncouplers. The most famous of these is dinitrophenol, or DNP. It's a proton ionophore, meaning that it can exist in both a protonated and an unprotonated form, and it's lipid-soluble so it can shuttle across the inner mitochondrial membrane, pick up a proton on one side, and deposit it on the other, shuttling the h ions across the membrane, bypassing ATP synthase, and releasing energy instead as heat. Since dinitrophenol releases energy as heat, that would make it harder for your body to retain this energy, those calories, so it was used as a diet pill starting in the 1930s. Two investigators from Stanford found that DNP increased the basal metabolic rate, which is because it makes ATP production less efficient and their study subjects lost weight. But it was only a few years later that DNP was removed from the market since it increased cataract formation and too many people were dying from hyperthermia by taking too much. Despite this ban decades ago, dinitrophenol is still widely available. It is very popular among bodybuilders to help reduce their body fat, and it's also used as a weight loss agent. Here are some pictures of two recent products containing DNP. Interestingly, both of these products are made by the same company, called Trigofarm, yet one label says that it's a fat burner, so obviously you're supposed to take it, but the other says it's a research chemical and pesticide that is not marketed for human consumption. But the goal of weight loss is too attractive, and people will take DNP, presumably because they don't know of the risks. Here are two newspaper articles that happen to both be about young British women dying from dinitrophenol toxicity. I'm not quite sure why the article on the right had to show her both with and without a Santa hat, because it's not really important to the story. In that story, it says that she accidentally overdosed on eight tablets. She felt unwell, but was still okay to drive herself to the hospital where she died so she cooked herself from the inside in just a matter of hours. Aspirin is another drug that can uncouple oxidative phosphorylation, although only at levels seen with severe toxicity. Again, this is because aspirin exists both in a protonated and unprotonated form, and it can dissolve into membranes and shuttle h ions across. So the really ironic thing here is that at therapeutic doses, aspirin is an antipyretic and reduces fever, but with severe overdose, it can raise your body temperature. Here's the summary slide. The mitochondrion is the powerhouse of the cell. It needs oxygen to produce a lot of ATP. If you don't have enough oxygen, you develop a metabolic acidosis with an elevated lactate. And this can happen in multiple ways. You might not have enough oxygen absorbed, which would be a respiratory problem. Not enough oxygen being delivered is a circulatory problem, but carbon monoxide can also be responsible. Not enough oxygen utilized is a toxicologic problem, and this occurs from cyanide, carbon monoxide, or from the formate ion metabolite of methanol, among others. Or you can have oxygen being utilized, but you're still not making ATP efficiently, and that's from uncouplers of oxidative phosphorylation. Over the next four slides, I wanted to highlight the relevant content of first aid for the USMLE Step 1 for you. In the biochemistry section, they show this figure of the electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation. There's what I consider to be a completely useless mnemonic device, DRACO, to remember how this can be poisoned. I think it's best to remember that dinitrophenol and aspirin can be uncouplers, while the most prominent inhibitors of oxidative phosphorylation you should remember are cyanide and carbon monoxide. And then there are the much less important inhibitors that are so low yield you can probably safely ignore them. Then there's this table detailing a bit more about oxidative phosphorylation poisons, and I put the most important points in these red boxes for you. This table suggests that fever is common in aspirin overdose, which is not true. Hyperthermia from uncoupling may occur in severe overdose, but it does not often occur. In the respiratory physiology section, we see this comparison of cyanide and carbon monoxide poisoning. Again, I've highlighted the most important parts. Both of them inhibit oxidative phosphorylation at complex 4, cytochrome C oxidase. Cyanide poisoning can be treated either with hydroxocobalamin or with nitrites to induce a small degree of methemoglobinemia. And carbon monoxide is treated with oxygen, either 100% normobaric O2 or with hyperbaric oxygen. The last part of the table shows the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve and how it is affected by carbon monoxide, both lowering the maximum oxygen carrying capacity and changing the shape of the curve from sigmoidal to hyperbolic. 
And I also added a reminder that standard pulse oximeters think that carboxyhemoglobin is oxyhemoglobin and will give a falsely elevated and therefore falsely reassuring O2 sat with carbon monoxide exposures. There are a couple of supplementary recommended articles for you available through Canvas. The first is a review article about carbon monoxide poisoning from the New England Journal of Medicine, and the other is a case report from some joker named Suchard about a woman who accidentally gave herself cyanide poisoning by eating apricot kernels, which contain cyanogenic glycosides. We are also providing a worksheet for you to fill out to self-test your comprehension. See how much of this you can do on your own and be as complete as possible before looking back through the video or the slide PDF to fill in any gaps. If you can answer these questions from memory, then I think you've learned the material just about as well as you'll need to do for USMLE Step 1 and for your clinical years. And that's all for now. I'll be seeing you around.